as people join, um, they can catch up with the recording. So I'd like to thank everybody who's here today. This is um, a CNCF webinar, and we're going to be talking about the need for a Kubernetes native message queue broker, um, KubeMQ. Now, I'm Alex Ellis. I'm the founder of OpenFaz and Inlet's the Cloud Native Tunnel. And as a CNCF ambassador, I'm going to be moderating this call and handling any questions that you might have as we uh, hear the presentation. So we'd all like to welcome our presenter today, Leo Nabat, CTO at KubeMQ. So welcome, Leo. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you all of us uh, hear me well. Um, good morning, good evening. If, we do have a few housekeeping items and then we'll hand it back over. But, yeah. um, basically, this is not your regular Zoom call. This is a webinar. And so as an attendee, you don't get to talk um, and be on the video, but you can drop your messages into the Q&A box and you should see that at the bottom right. Now, we also have chat. And so what we'll do is as Leah presents is I'll occasionally interrupt and ask some of the questions as we're going through. We might not be able to answer all the questions, but we'll do our best and anything else we'll follow up with at the end. Now, this is actually a, an official CNCF webinar, which means that we're subject to the code of conduct. So please just don't say anything that you wouldn't say in public that might be in violation of the code of conduct and that, you know, we just need to be respectful of the participants and the presenters. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Leon. We're going to kick off the presentation, the need for Kubernetes native message queue broker. So thank you. Thank you, Alex, again. Uh, good morning, good evening, depending where are you, I, you all. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I will try to, in the next hour, to um, present you a solution of uh, a Kubernetes native message queue broker. What we're going to do, I'm not going to bomb you with uh, many slides and the 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 theoretical information. Uh, I'm going to uh, go over of uh, the need um, some use cases, um, some architecture uh, examples, and also we'd like to uh, um, share with you some two demos that actually in real life show uh, um, uh, typical usage of uh, messaging queue inside the uh, Kubernetes. So uh, I will start, and again, uh, if there's some questions, as, so Alex can. Um, help me here to uh, and will uh, facilitate them through the presentation. Okay, so let's start. Um, in some uh, broad and, uh, you know, some kind of uh, uh, basic understanding when we move into Kubernetes um, and starting to build microservices, most of the uh, most of the solutions that you have and service to service point to point connectivity means that you can use rest interface or grpc or even use some kind of uh, service mesh that actually you deploy a, a data plan and actually you hardly in a hard in a hard way connect between uh, uh, between services um, and it gives some kind of uh, uh, complexity to your uh, uh, architecture. This means that in some point, for example, um, if you need to broadcast a, a messaging or to stream or to use some kind of asynchronous messaging between two services, um, it, it, you need to handle it in the services business logic. And then when you starting to decouple uh, your uh, microservices and again, when you're starting to use Kubernetes very best uh, tools of deployment, replicas, and doing uh, um, some, uh, um, some uh, load balancing, it's starting to create some kind of challenges, how to really connect between services, what you're going to do with service discovery, how you can reach other services, what you are going to do with versioning, um, if you're uh, changing, for example, um, uh, uh, your API definition between services. So um, to this uh, um, um, to this challenge, and this is not uh, uh, it's not new. 
a messaging uh, broker or queue um, is um, one way to um, work with that actually the all the services knows the messaging queue uh, or the message broker um, uh, address and now can communicate between them through the message uh, uh, queue broker and uh, allow uh, a lot of flexibility and endless possibilities from architecture point of view. Um, so um, if um, uh, you would like, if when you put inside, uh, um, um, inside your cluster um, a messaging, um, uh, a messaging broker, you started to gain um, some some advantages com compared to a different solution. For example, I will talk about how when you're going to when you put uh, some kind of message broker outside of your cluster, but when you put it inside, uh, first you started to gain from the benefits um, of uh, Kubernetes. If you, for example, um, using tracing metrics, you and it's embedded in your uh, um, cluster, you can enjoy, for example, end-to-end -end tracing between services. Also, from security point of view, everything is inside the cluster. Third, uh, it's uh, also the ability to replicate and build clusters and mini clusters, put them on the edge, for example, means that if you your architecture is using some kind of uh, messaging, uh, uh, messaging queue broker uh, capabilities, you gain uh, the, 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 Kubernetes, uh, uh, um, the, the Kubernetes benefits also with your, uh, uh, with your architecture. So from, from IT perspective, um, it will be, for example, if you need to deploy um, uh, the whole backend or to deploy some kind of uh, architecture, when uh, um, a native uh, queue, message queue, uh, uh, for example, it has an operator, uh, you can uh, build it through your pipeline with your CI CD, you can deploy it uh, very quick, you can scale, you can downscale up and down, you can use whatever kind of controllers that you uh, uh, want to uh, um, you want to use. And also it's unified the operation, the workflow of all your uh, um, deployment. Now, um, some some of the um, um, some of the solution today um, is um, uh, trying. Uh, um, are, uh, so sorry, some of the solution today are not built into Kubernetes. If we talk about um, traditional one uh, like uh, Kafka or um, um, Rabbit or any kind of other, uh, we call it uh, um, uh, we call it legacy one. What we saw that as many uh, many companies, many solution actors putting it outside of the cluster. Once you're putting such a very important component outside of your cluster, you're actually starting to lose some of the benefit of Kubernetes and actually expose some challenges, um, uh, some challenges like security. For example, uh, if for example you're using um, uh, as, um, um, and, and do rotation of uh, um, your TLS certificates, uh, it, it's almost impossible to do it with some kind of entity that actually it's outside of the cluster and actually it's you open and expose your security uh, domains outside of the cluster. You double the traffic, um, you need an additional um, environment maintenance. It's sometimes um, 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 uh, some kind um, of uh, uh, um, some kind of additional overhead that you need. Um, of course, you can use and you can deploy. Um, um, you can deploy on uh, Kafka or Rabbit or something like that inside your cluster. But think about uh, for the for example, putting a cluster on the edge. Okay, in on the edge, you have limited resources. You have uh, some uh, some other challenges that actually a big solution like Kafka that you need five six nodes in only only to support very simple one um, 
um, and it's not so tightly integrated inside uh, 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 Kubernetes. So it's, it's also kind of challenges, uh, 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 challenge to do. Um, so the reason is more like a, a, a more like very small solution that you can deploy anywhere on the edge, on, on the cluster, uh, on your backend, and actually you can connect between them and do many, many, um, many, many solutions. Um, I will uh, another uh, another option. Uh, another cool thing is that. Um, is once you uh, have a message broken inside your cluster, you 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 can now start and use the, uh, the 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 message broker as a gateway to many other services that you now you don't need to write interface to them. For example, if you have um, a cache like Redis, I will show it in a minute, or you have uh, some kind of uh, a log or for like Elastic, or you have a databases, and you have something like that. Um, if you have services that need now this kind of uh, this kind of uh, 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 if you have some application that need this kind of services for them, instead to um, to connect them directly or manage directly, um, uh, you can use the um, um, the cube uh, or the, the, the Kubernetes message broker inside in order to route messages and connect it, uh, between them. Uh, with connectors or any kind of uh, interface with, between them. I will give another uh, very good example and I'm going to show it uh, uh, in a minute. For example, you have an API and you have an API that need to connect to a database. Typical, uh, uh, typical solution is will have like a, a container or deployment of this API that will have the database connection inside it connect directly uh, to a database and this uh, it's potentially problem. Instead, if you can decouple them with the message broker, you can connect the API directly to the message broker and the message broker um, and another service would connect also to the message broker and this service will handle all the connectivity and all the requests uh, for this database. And then you can scale, for example, you have, uh, um, if you have uh, uh, um, um, high traffic, you can do versioning, you can, uh, circle uh, and rotate uh, security. So it's more, in some point, more robust uh, 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 architecture. Now, uh, let's talk about, uh, about five typical use cases. Sorry, um, uh, five uh, typical use cases um, that um, is uh, most of usage of uh, a message broker um, inside Kubernetes. The first one is a multi-stage pipeline. Multi-stage pipeline, uh, data processing pipeline is very, um, very common scenario that you have some kind of pipeline uh, work uh, of uh, um, moving um, object of data that need to be processed by different processor. For example, if you need um, um, to queue um, some uh, um, some um, predefined work to do. You have a, a, a the first stage of processor that take it from the queue, do some kind of processing and move it to another stage on the queue. Uh, for example, in security system, you you have multiple cleaners. For example, that need to clean the data uh, as a pipeline. So using a multi-stage data processing pipeline with processors. Uh, is a typical usage of uh, um, uh, um, of a message queue, and here is the queue, because um, mainly we're going to talk about uh, patterns of messaging, and the patterns of messaging that uh, is uh, we're going to talk about them uh, are queues, our our PCs, our um, um, streaming, um, um, real time, non real time, and all the application around them. One one important mess, uh, one important um, uh, thing to um, uh, to see is also the ability to have like some kind of like a dead letter message. You, if you're familiar with Amazon SQLs or something like that, you are able to, for example, if you fail in any stage to process some kind of message, it will a message you will fail over to a different queue that another special process. 
will be able to take it and process it or throw it uh, to the garbage in order not to uh, bulk the queue and actually stop all the processing. So this is a very typical um, um, uh, uh, scenario. Um, another one is, is very, uh, very familiar, actually most of the usage of queuing uh, is like job and task distributed queue, that you have many, many, uh, uh, many producers that actually sending tasks and job and going through um, and sending to a messaging queue. And on the other hand, some workers are taking this kind of information from the queue and processing it as uh, 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 different from the um, uh, different from the um, other other um, uh, for, for, from the previous uh, use case. Um, there, uh, the previous use case is use some kind, like kind of a serial path of moving object between a pro processor. Here, there is no meaning. Uh, to the time or the um, um, uh, or, or the synchronization between them. So actually, there's a queue that actually distributing work between them, very similar to many many other solutions. But you have it inside in your uh, cluster. So Leo, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Would you say here that you could, for instance, limit the the level of parallelism or concurrency between those workers for each queue? Yes. Of course, you can limit, uh, for example, you can um, limit the um, uh, amount of, for, from your perspective, workers can be um, any amount of uh, um, subscribers that can be in parallel or one. You can do, for example, you can do some kind of multicasting of messages between them. So you have a, a, a very uh, good control of how you can throttle the the, the messaging um, uh, between them, and also you can control what happened. For example, if you, you need, if you need deletion, expiration, delay of messages, um, um, a transaction, for example, what happened if you uh, getting a, a message and you can cannot handle, you can return to the queue and and not continuing to do something like that. So yes, you have a very yeah. big uh, 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 control of this. So the other the other question is here is really, you know, there, there are open source projects that are well integrated into Kubernetes like RabbitMQ and Kafka. So we're being asked, what's the real difference here, and why would you use um, maybe KubeMQ instead of those solutions? Okay, couple of them. First, um, um, both of them, Kafka. Uh, Kafka is more traditional for streaming type of. Uh, um, messaging uh, uh, application. Um, Rabbit is more uh, uh, extensive one, um, but both of them are not designed to run uh, from, in the, from the beginning in Kubernetes. First, first um, um, the need uh, for a lot of resources. Second, uh, KubeMQ has some kind of unique features that others don't have. Um, and like a GLPC interface, multicasting, um, queuing, authorization, authentication, uh, pre-built in uh, routing, uh, many, um, and of course, all the at least one, exactly one, at most one, all these messaging patterns, um, support metrics, Prometheus, everything is built in. And you don't need to write almost any uh, line of code. You don't need to build another uh, um, uh, another business logic on top of it. Um, and it's very small, about 30 megs of, of container, and it can deploy anywhere. Um, and has its own uh, um, written in Go. He has its own uh, capabilities. So um, you can use uh, Kafka or, and Rabbit, but you need also some a lot of knowledge of um, the, um, from DevOps, uh, DevOps uh, um, uh, capabilities, even you can run as an operator. You don't even need to configure it. Only one ex simple example is there is no configuration in QBMQ means that you don't need to define no queues, no ex uh, no um, uh, exchanges, zero configuration means that you up and it's running. And when you send a message, you open a queue, open open a, a topic. If you receive any, it's doing everything it for you. And it's very flexible. 
this Great. is that's awesome. very informative answers there we've got a couple more questions but you know i want to give you a chance to do your presentation so i'll, I'll find another opportunity okay no problem um so this is the uh, uh distributed queue um another one is uh the stream messaging process is very similar uh, very, um, for example, in ATA type of uh, applications, uh, such uh, uh, that you need um, uh, to process a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, um, uh, messages and starting to route them to a different uh, different uh, services like pipeline, data stores, um, machine learning. Another um, um, another very quite uh, uh, interesting pattern is very well is the ability to do uh, um, pub sub uh, in real time messaging is fast that you, for example, you need to distribute it a lot of data. Also um, in and out, fan in and fan out also that you can actually distribute a lot of data. And the most, I think, uh, very uh, common one is for example, this one. Uh, and this is the, the, what we call the application decouple and microservices. Um, this means that um, uh, you can now have the, uh, the message queue as a message broker um, that handling all the small pieces and all the services and all the connectivity between um, all the services. And this brings me to actually show you a real example, real life example um, of uh, uh, of such uh, uh, um, such a, uh, such a, such an application. So maybe I will stop here, and you can ask you uh, some question, and then we can go. Yeah, and yeah, sure. I mean, if you've got if you've got a demo to get ready, you could start with that. So this is kind of going there of this slide. What would happen if you had a Kubernetes cluster on premises and a Kubernetes cluster on Amazon and um, could KubeMQ somehow federate between the two of them? That's one yes. of the questions. Yes. And how? How uh, they can connect between them. You you can define some kind of like what we call it the gateway, and then you can they connect between them uh, directly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we, uh, we have some kind of similar demo, uh, something like that, and uh, we're going to show yeah. some kind of how we migrate from uh, uh, how we're going to migrate. Uh, um, uh, um, an old system to a new system with some kind of bridging. I will show it uh, uh, later on. Now, the other, the other one, just maybe as you as you sort of click through and get your demo ready, is um, you know all of these sort of solutions do need storage because if a pod crashes, we lose the data. So, how are you handling that? Are you using persistent storage? Do you need a volume for it? Yeah, um, actually. Um, um, it's a great question because we found out in the beginning that um, uh, first of all, yes, you, you, you de decide how much volume uh, you want and it will create uh, um, a PVC for you, uh, persistent volume claim. This is a stateful set. Means that it's maintain some consistency between all the ports. What we saw over more than two years of operation of, uh, uh, of CubeMQ is that more and more users that the user are not using the persistency because they're starting to move to other um, messaging patterns that don't need uh, uh, persistency. Means that if you must have uh, persistency because you don't you don't need to you not willing to uh, to lose one message uh, and. Uh, when I'm saying not, not willing to use one message, it means that when all your cluster is down, all the uh, all the uh, message queue is down, all the nodes are down. Means that if you have three size of three or five, uh, even without persistent volume defined, you actually have all um, all the messages. Means that you are not losing it. Only if you're going to wipe out your cluster without persistent and something really bad happening, you're going to lose if you're not going to use a uh, persistent volume. But if it's important for you, yes, no problem. When you, uh, when you uh, define your cluster, you can set any amount of uh, volume you, you need and it, it will uh, take the claim and create it for you. Okay. Is there any way we could find out a bit more about that maybe at the end? I don't know if Oz has a link. He could, he could maybe send in the chat later just to sort of 
um, help people look through that. It sounds interesting. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. So um, let's um, have some kind of um, um, some kind of um, um, a typical application. What we call it a user domain. User domain is some kind of um, um, some kind of um, a solution or what we call it microservice architecture for the domain users domain it means that it's like an API and um, and a web interface that I would like to create a user get a verification code I would like to do some kind of verification um, I do would like to do log logging and log out very small uh, typical uh, uh, typical um, typical uh, uh, application of of how you manage users or something like that. So I will show you some kind of um, um, architecture that uh, we quickly build and show the, the capabilities um, uh, of what I'm, what I'm talking about. What we have here is services and the services as we have a kind of web API and we have some kind of a web server. I'm going to show you in a minute how it works. This is the, uh, um, the web server will serve the, the, the form and it will work with the web API that from one hand will get the request and will communicate um, uh, all the messages over the QBMQ. And we have some kind of other services that connected to some um, some other services. We have a cache for Redis, and I will show show you uh, 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 in a minute some how it works. Also, we have a, a PostgreSQL. This will be our users database, and we have also Elasticsearch that actually will do some kind of like an auditing and log all the messages that happening in this architecture. Very simple. And also, I'm going to show you how it looks like. Uh, in in inside of uh, uh, the messaging broker um, and the capabilities that you can see uh, um, uh, with it. So so the first thing I'm going, going to do is to do a login, and the login will have uh, will involve some kind of going to directly to the uh, database and do some kind of what we call a query, um, like an RPC. It will send a query to the database and ask if this user exists. If not, he will create it and send it back for verification. Then he will send you some kind of a token and then you need to do some kind of verification. Means that again, he will ask and, uh, and, and send some kind of a command to the uh, database and do verification. Then, we're going to do a login. Here, it will be much more interesting. Here, first of all, he will see in the cache if this user has already logged in. If yes, he will actually take and do all the work from the cache. If not, he will work from the database. Now, instead, he will, you don't, you don't have it in the cache. He will go to the database, get confirmation of login, and then update the uh, cache for uh, uh, the connectivity information and we'd go out. Then if you are going to do log out, what he will do, he will mark that the users log out and also clean the cache. So it means that the next time he will do log in, he will need to do again, uh, um, again, uh, uh, the full login. And again, all the uh, messages will be logged out automatically to, um, to the Elasticsearch. Okay. so. Give me one second. I'm going to um, share the screen. I hope you see this one. Okay. You see this? Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, we, I'm going to put some kind of some new user. Give some kind of password, some kind of email, some email, email.com, and then I will do some kind of register. What we're going to see here, we're going to see some kind of messaging, 
that it was successfully get the token verification i will do again verification verify i can get the login the login now we go again to the database and i will show them in how in real time it happened and then we can do uh, a log out if for example before you do log out they can do very quickly again the login sorry yeah and it, it would be much much faster than because going now to the cache and i can do now a log out and log in again more or less this is the um this is the the flow for example we can see some kind of uh, uh, errors that happen for example if i do a log um a log out or something that i'm already logged out i will be already logged out if i'm going to do some kind of uh, bad verification i will have bad verification if i have for example some bad registration already already exists so this is like a simple uh, uh, typical application and now what i'm going to do i'm going to switch to some kind of a nice thing that you're going to show you um, a little bit the instant the things that running inside what i uh, hope you, you see this one there yeah it looks good oh, 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 went one second yeah let's get that screen back yeah okay um the cube has a, 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 a very uh, a neat uh, um, uh, cli that actually um uh, easy to use and actually can create and do a lot of uh, nice things what is nice about it it can actually do um a, a attach to a specific pattern and channel and actually can monitor what happened inside so what i'm going to do here i'm going to do the same um uh, same flow with different information and i'll show you exactly uh what's going on in each each uh, each um uh, each channel for the first one uh, i'm going to um um shoot the 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 monitor the monitoring for the elastic set we got the history one now it's connected now i'm going to go into the users channel this is will be with the database and the third one i'm going to show you for the cache this is the, for, for going to, uh, to the cache what is the it's doing now it's actually connected to the cluster uh um and actually do uh, um a monitor like attaching to a specific uh, information in the different uh, in my um in my uh, users in in the webs i did i will do now a new user one second One of the other questions as you're just doing your demo is, could, is uh, a Kubernetes job a current valid trigger or input for this? Again, again. That, could we trigger um, a queue from a Kubernetes job? Is that current use case? You can, no problem. Um, you can create some kind of, uh, um, um, uh, Kubernetes Kube has a REST interface. Yeah. You can have a like a webhook that you can send specifically to and a queue or, or, or event or something like that it has a streaming you can stream up you can stream down this is also in in websocket rest interface web so i mean like if i wanted to do that i guess i have to write a console application package it in a docker image and then create the job the job will connect to kubemq uh, yeah yeah you can. In, yeah okay so hopefully that's answered the question gilliam um also, do you have any kind of, so this is almost like a tracing that you're showing us with your CLI, but is there any integration with um, open consensus or any other projects like that? Yeah, uh, it's a building, all, all the all the spans that you're sending on gRPC and the rest are actually going through uh, the messaging. It means that actually you have an end-to-end -end span. It's uh, integrated with open sensors uh, um, integration. Great, thank you. So um, what we saw here, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, messages, but what we can see is that uh, um, uh, the, the message, um, for example, uh, going through um, the Postgres one executed, this is a query and so I, I get uh, through. And here we, in the upside, we can see, again, this is the base uh, 64 because we actually we see the data 
uh, on side uh, um, on side of the um, uh, uh, of the message broker. But let's continue and uh, and again. But what I'm going to show what, want to see is what's happening with the with the cash. Okay, what happened is that it, it, you can see that he tried to uh, when I did the login, he tried to find. Okay, uh, do I have this? Uh, uh, user. If not, I get a, a message. And this is a key, uh, one of the key nice things uh, about it is that you can send a query or send um, a command and then you can set some kind of a timeout or, uh, and then when you don't get information, you can, you, you get an arrow up and you can continue and, and work on it. And if I, if I have it, for example, I have this information again, so I get it back already I have a request and I get back uh, uh, back response and again like a log out I can have more and then um, um, uh, send back uh, uh, information so this is uh, this is a typical um, um, application of multi-service how you can use um, um, Kubernetes message broker uh, kubemq with the um, events um, query commands, uh, capabilities. So maybe before I'm going to the next uh, um, um, use case and also some kind of a demo, very interesting, interesting one. If you have more question, I can get. Yeah. So my my question as a developer is, um, where can I see this sample code? Uh, um, of this one. Yeah. Uh, well, we can upload it to. Um, we can upload it some kind of repository. Yeah, uh, if you, I mean, okay. if you have a Twitter account for KubeMQ, maybe you could send it out and folks okay. could follow you. I'll, I'll find the link for um, KubeMQ and put it into the chat. Yeah. Um, somebody is asking about, you know, what is the sort of maximum throughput? Has this been like compared to other products? And, you know, what, what kind of the word is RMQ? What are you getting in terms of requests per second? Um, first of all, um, this is written in Go and getting all the benefits in, of Go. Means that um, it's very small and we manage, um, I, I will give some kind of example and maybe it's very related to the next demo because this is a one, one example. Um, we have installation um, of QMQ in, in financial services that they're shooting billions of billions of messages per, per hour. Uh, because you need to push a lot of data of quotes and and uh, uh, and data um, in our tests you can get uh, with the of course with the proper um, hardware and memory and the memory footprint is very very small you can get eight ten million se um, uh, message per second again it's depend on your um, uh, on your hardware specification but it's yeah. no problem to get very high throughput um, and again depends. Uh, on your pattern it means that if your patterns is with persistency, you actually bound. Actually, the bottleneck is the network and uh, and, and all the uh, uh, all the what's happening with all the persistency. And also, it's also how you create your cluster. How many replicas you have in the cluster is using yeah. rough protocols. Yeah, so it, 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 it does some sound like there's some variables there. We've got around twenty minutes left. Okay to use how you see fit and people can continue to ask questions as we go along. Okay. So um, the next uh, thing I'm going to talk about is I'm going to switch to new share. Bear one second. Is some kind of what we call migration. Most um, we saw also with many companies that we work is they have a on-prem installation of old systems like MSMQ, for example, in .NET, or if you have also even Kafka or something like that, and um, and it's you would like to start moving your infrastructure to Kubernetes. Once you, for example, if you're going to use, and this is some kind of real case that we had, is we wanted to move from MSMQ, MSMQ base 
system um, that doing uh, financial trading um, that run on-prem. And when we wanted to move to Kubernetes, there is no MSMQ capabilities inside Kubernetes. It means that we need to, we need some kind of solution. Um, what uh, we are doing here is actually uh, doing something called bridging. Means that we put some kind of bridge on the old prem, uh, uh, on prem uh, side, and I'm going to show you it. And this bridge, from one hand, connect to the legacy legacy uh, um, um, system. If it can be even IBM MQ, it can be MSMQ, it can be any kind of legacy one. And now you can start uh, relaying messages, actually like a, a like a, a, a clients to this one, and then move and connect to a, a KubeMQ in Kubernetes, and then you can send and starting to migrate services to Kubernetes. Um, what I'm going, going to show you is um, this one. Um, this one is a, um, a demo that we did to, to Microsoft Azure team that we showed them the capability how to migrate a full .NET um, um, based architecture to um, um, uh, full uh, Kubernetes and that actually uses MSMQ. And what we have here is some kind of uh, financial data uh, um, uh, application that um, that has, uh, for one has some kind of generator of quotes, um, have some kind of command that's sending to MSMQ. And then this is the old one. And also you have some kind of API service and you have client. But once you want to move to Kubernetes, what we have uh, done and show them is, one second, is this one. Is we the same, uh, more the same architecture Okay, but now we have some kind of a bridge that connecting to KubeMQ in AKS, and I, I will show you. And then you have a database for persistency and the API service actually migrate from the uh, last one to the new one with, with the client. Um, so I'm going to a um, little bit show one second. Okay, this is... Um, Oh, wait a second. Okay, you you see the, the screen? No. Yeah, we can see that. It looks very animated. Oh, oh and now it's gone again. Oh, one second. I will make sure that this is the screen. Yes. Okay. What there we, we see? Are. Yeah. What, what what we see here is like a very small um, example of quotes. You have some uh, like a. Um, uh, for exchange uh, um, uh, client that's sending, getting, uh, um, getting quotes in high throughput from such um, such architecture. So what happened is that this is the front end. Okay. Now I'm going to maybe going to see and I can switch to this one. You see some kind. This is the legacy one. You see the Microsoft, Microsoft servers. 2012, what we see here, we have some kind of generator of data in the, uh, I don't know, uh, purple, no, not purple, like a green. Yeah, we uh, see that. Yeah, and we have some kind of message, a message worker. Actually, this is this is like like a bridge connecting to, uh, um, um, connecting to, um, um, uh, to a cube and cube that's sitting on um, um, AKS. And in the AKS, uh, in, uh, in AKS, we have a, a KubeMQ cluster with the service that actually you can uh, present this. Now, what nice thing about it is that we are, it's not only the streaming of data, you can actually stop. It's like a command that I'm sending to the, uh, to the old on-prem and can resume this information. So it's like showing, Showing here some kind of migration from old uh, and legacy to uh, a new one. So you're simulating this data, and you yeah. can yeah, yeah, stop yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, it. Yeah, we're simulating this data. Um, yeah. yeah, here's the simulation that from the data that actually you're doing, and here is 
the uh, 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 the blue one is the, actually the bridge that actually uh, this is uh, um, um, the green one sending to MSMQ. The yeah. bridge is taking the data from MSMQ and relayed to QMQ that's sitting on uh, AKS. And then this is what you see here connecting to it directly. Do you, somebody's asking whether you've got any, whether you've got any more information. I don't know if Oz has a link he could add, um, who is Leo's um, co-worker around distributed transaction support. So not just tracing, but when you open a transaction across the whole queue, it might have multiple parts. You, um, you have um, the ability to um, have um, transactional um, queue message means that when you receive a message, it's very similar to uh, Amazon XQS. Uh, you can um, uh, get a message from a queue and hold it for a specific time that you want. And then you can acknowledge, reject, rerouted, or if it's not processed correctly, you can throw it or you can send it to some kind of dead letter queue and then kill the chain uh, of the transaction. Now, there is a ability to do some kind, what we call it, a, a chain of transaction. It means that you can, what you can do is you can have one, uh, you can have, for example, the first processor that taking the first message, he can, he can hold it, send and to another one, another one, another one, and then you can have, for example, if some, some of, uh, um, uh, someone is failing, you can actually send back um, uh, a notification and everything will be canceled. Uh, so this is also a, a possible uh, architecture and very easy to implement. We have done it a couple of times and show it to other customers how to do it very quick, very easily. Great, thank you. Now, do we also have any kind of integration with RBAC or the Kubernetes um, certificate authority? You mentioned that earlier about rotating the certificates. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, first of all, uh, you, know, you can, uh, we're going to release, uh, um, I think this week or next week, um, an operator that will be much, much uh, easier and actually um, uh, be able to, uh, be able to facilitate all of this. So, yes. Well, I think we're really looking for a bit more detail on that, but um, Kev, I guess that's what we have for you right now. Um, what's the strategy around HA? So like when we come to disaster recovery, things just completely lost, what, what can we do? If you have a persistent volume, it's going up, and take it from the persistent volume and rebuild, um, um, rebuild the, the logs and what you need to do. It's it's based on rough protocol. If you don't have persistent volume, you lo you know you you're losing it. Um, but um, it's a stateful set, so uh, you get you gaining all the uh, benefit of uh, stateful set. It's have no dependency. You don't need, for example, you don't need Zookeeper. You don't need other other uh, uh, dependencies that you need to install before it. It's it's, it's one container uh, per each uh, node, you know, three five, and that, and that's it. Great. I assume that this is integrated could be integrated to any Kubernetes service. Someone is asking specifically about Amazon EKS. Um, yeah. It it looks to me like this would just work the same on any. Distribution, yeah, yeah. Any, anywhere um, uh, in the cloud, on-prem, any anything that actually support uh, uh, Kubernetes, it can run anywhere. Did you cover how to install yet? What? Do, how's the best way to sort of install this? Okay, um, you have a couple options. Helm, soon to be a Pareto. We're now going in the in the next uh, week, and also you can. Um, uh, use the the, um, the CLI, um, and then you can uh, very in very quick way you can install um, and manage um, uh, with the CLI uh, all, all 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 the needs that uh, 
uh, you have in mind. You can install, update, you can, the, the nice thing about the CLI that you can actually work with it and, um, and develop with it means that you don't need, uh, uh, you can send messages, you can see what's going on between them. And if you want, we have a few minutes, you can, I can even show how very quickly you can uh, integrate uh, uh, showing work and, uh, and, uh, and develop with it. With it. Uh, one example is uh, when you have a, a cluster, uh, a remote cluster, and you would like to connect uh, and work with this, you typically need to do uh, port forwarding or just a lot of uh, uh, hassle. Uh, the QBMQ CTL, this is the, um, um, uh, the command line, uh, the CLI, you, uh, you can do very quickly something called um, a cluster proxy. And actually what you're going to do is going to uh, automatically port forward all the ports to your local host and you can actually develop and work as is in your local host and very easy. Uh, uh, very easy to do. Send messages, simulate all the queuing functions, everything you can do uh, with the CLI. Thank you for that. Sorry for the um, feedback from my keyboard there, answering questions. So I think we've had a lot of questions actually. Um, we've answered well over 14 on the Q&A and then a few more. Um, is there anything else you'd like to show us in the last sort of couple of minutes that you've got? Um, maybe uh, uh, Yes, sir. Maybe we can. Uh, um, Did we finish the slides and the contact details? And if somebody wants to reach out to you and find out more. Yeah. One second. I will show it. <clears throat> yeah, Leo. Um, I've seen a question about the multi clustering in Kubernetes for KubeMQ. So maybe you can address that. Yeah, uh, you can connect between um, um, clusters. Um, what we have done is something like. Uh, like uh, uh, there's another component called gateway that you can install it. And now each cluster um, connect to this, uh, can connect to this gateway and message between, uh, uh, between clusters. Um, this is one option. Um, if there's another option for hard connectivity, you can actually build some kind of very small connector that will have gRPC connectivity between, uh, between clusters. But again, it's, it's one of the, the things that we are really like to do and cooperate is, is to hear feedback and things that we need maybe to add, um, um, add uh, uh, to it. One of the example is, for example, authorization. This is very unique feature of uh, KubeMQ. You can upload some kind of authorization uh, file that will can per specific per resource, like in uh, access access layer uh, access uh, control is that you can um, allow service per pattern per channel per specifically to allow or not uh, um, 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 uh, uh, not to allow access to its uh, access to 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 the message broker together with uh, JWT token authentication, and also some kind of multicasting build. For, for example, you can uh, send uh, a message uh, to event, the same message you can send to event, and then multiple to also to a queue or different queues in the same message. You don't need to send a couple of them you know, to different services. You can in one message, you can say, okay, please send it to, as an event to this, channel, please also log it in a queue to this channel and also send it to some kind of event store to this channel and also uh, replicate it to this channel in, in, one, in one message. This is another feature of uh, KubeMQ that uh, uh, you, you, you can use. Thank you for that explanation. Is there any final word or is there sort of anything you want to tell us to sort of sum up? Yeah, uh, to sum up, uh, just to give you some kind of... Uh, 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 KubeMQ um, currently is a closed source project. It will be open source um, soon. Um, we're going to open source the, what we call the community side of it, um, uh, of the KubeMQ. It's free and it will be always be free. Um, currently, even today, it's free. You can use it, you can download it, you can install it very quickly. It will take you five seconds to install it. Um, 
you can use the, 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 the link on, the, on, on our website, the quick start, you can see very quickly how to, uh, to use it. So, so from licensing point of view, it's free to use to, uh, to you how, how, as much as you want. Um, um, there is a, a, an enterprise version that you have additional uh, features that uh, uh, um, uh, you, can, you can use. And in, in the enterprise is also already open source. You can have and see uh, and get the code. Um, more or less, then that is uh, play with this. Um, this is already um, deployed and production ready for almost two years. Runs already in many clusters, mainly in the financial in financial uh, applications. Uh, we'll be very happy to um, hear from you if you need support. We have also a Slack channel. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you, Oz, for joining. And I guess we'll wrap things up there. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Please keep an eye out for the next webinar. It'd be great to have you back again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.